Willie, you got to be close by. Should we switch? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's yours. Alrighty, let's get started. All right. Welcome everybody to uh, our, our uh, fireside chat, our, our session here today with, uh, with Bob Lord. It's our, our pleasure to have you here, Bob, at, uh, at Astro Labs uh, for the second time. Yeah. Uh, Bob is the uh, Chief Digital Officer of IBM globally. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real honor to have you back here in Dubai uh, at, uh, at Astro Labs. Uh, this is the, uh, so you, you've, you've come back here um, and uh, are, are participating here with us today, so we thank you for that. Um, uh, Bob is the Chief Digital Officer of IBM. So I guess before we jump into everything, yep. got a lot of questions for you. Okay. Um, but I'd love to hear from you, what is a Chief Digital Officer? What does a Chief Digital Officer do? Okay. Uh, tell us about your role. All right, so first, well, first of all, I have to say congratulations. Thank you. Um, I was here two years ago, and Astro Labs was only around the corner in that small little space that that I think you guys started in. I think you guys have done a phenomenal job sort of inspiring the startup community here. So just congratulations. I think some of the new programs, some of you are probably involved with, hopefully you're getting a lot of benefit out of them. Um, we're committed at IBM to really help power the startup and the entrepreneur community. And I think what, Mohammed, you guys have done here has been pretty phenomenal. Especially as I go around the world, I think this is a really, really unique value proposition uh, to the startup ecosystem. And you guys should be actually you're, you have some advantage, I would suggest to you, by having this community. Um, from even what I see in Silicon Valley, and I think some of the accelerator programs there, there's a lot of debate in Silicon Valley right now um, about whether accelerators actually really create some momentum um, in startups, or are they really valuable, or are they crutches? And you start to see some of the acceleration programs now actually not really performing, and a lot of them shutting down. But I do think you've hit on um, a, a sort of a really good sort of, uh, sort of intersection of supporting a startup and giving them some business foundations. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, appreciate that. It's really that. good stuff. Um, so look, the chief digital officer. Um, so I'm the first one in 107 years um, at IBM. Um, I've been there for t only two and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I have my background much more in sort of the digital uh, technology space uh, as CEO of Razorfish and then most recently with AOL. So my, my pedigree comes from uh, the transformation world uh, because I was in that business for 15 years helping very large enterprises figure out how to move their models in a different way. And a lot of the basis that we brought uh, to bear when I was at Razorfish was all about how does a startup get going? How do you do things differently in, an organ in a very large organization? So my job at IBM, unlike I think what a lot of the IBMers thought when I first came on board, which was to just help change the website and you know maybe change the color and uh, do those <laughs> kinds of things. My, the core, um, importantly, is reporting into Ginny Rometty, who's the CEO, was to really help the company think about how do we transform and how do we do things differently? Um, and how do we go after new buyer sets? Um, so if you think about uh, the ability of, of people accessing our technology easier, I'd suggest to you when I first got yep. here, it was a bit of a dream. Mm -hmm. um, but now as a developer, you can get online and you can go to our code patterns and you can access Watson technology or our blockchain technology within a minute. Okay, and any of you who are developers, I'm assuming there's a lot of them here in the room, I don't know. Um, you know, you don't want to waste any time, right? The, 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 uh, the rule we have if is a developer can't get to our technology in less than five minutes, they're going to move on to something else. They're going to go to one of our competitors to go access that technology. So we had a, we had a really big uh, hurdle to cross as a company uh, so that people could self-service and get to our technology in ways that we couldn't do before. Yeah. Um, so, so that was, when you think about what I've done, it's more of just exposing IBM and unleashing IBM so the whole world can access our technology to have an impact. And I don't think the company was known for that before. IBM was known as a company that was very monolithic 
uh, could help out really big governments, can help out enterprise companies, but they weren't known as a, a company to go to to really help power startups and developers to have impact on the world, and, and hopefully that's what happened. Yeah, so I guess on that note yep. uh, specifically, I mean, everybody's read the news about the uh, the, the Red Hat news, yep. uh, but uh, it would be good to get your perspective on the, imp the impetus behind the acquisition of, of Red Hat, why, why um, and what does that mean for uh, the strategy and the engagement with uh, developers, with startups going forward with IBM? Yeah, so um, I think, importantly, just signaling Red Hat, right, was all, and number one, really big, big acquisition, really, really big number. $34 is, billion. Yeah, dollars this is like betting, biggest, the, this yeah. is betting the company on uh, where we're going as IBM. And I think credit to Ginny Rometty to sort of take a bold move in the marketplace. And I op absolutely, we have changed the game in the software business. Um, this is just going to revolutionize, I believe, how people use technology in the future. And the basis of that is around open source and our commitment to open source. Uh, so everyone knows Red Hat is an open source company. Um, you know, they have a very, very profitable business that they built on top of open source. They're one of the key companies that have actually committed to open source just as much as IBM has, but built a very profitable model on top of that with sort of their enterprise uh, additions around Linux. If you're a very big enterprise or you're building a business, you can only use open source for a period of time. At a certain point, you have to have a support infrastructure behind you to know that if I have a critical mission fail on my business, I've got somebody behind me to help me, okay? So open source is one step to get there. Um, and Red Hat symbolizes what that is. Um, and with IBM and Red Hat, Red Hat will be run as an independent company because you're not going to actually you don't want to mess up you know the philosophy about what open source is but at the same time there are synergies between what IBM offers and what Red Hat office, office, uh, offers to enterprise clients and that's really the area that we're going to operate in together so um, so I think it's a really fundamental point about we believe that the the software business is going to operate in an open source world we also believe that the world's infrastructure is going to be in a hybrid cloud environment. That there is not, this public cloud environment is good for certain things. So when you think about an Amazon, you think about Azure, uh, you think about Google Cloud, they've come at the world from a public cloud in standpoint to support business, right? Yeah. We've always come at it from an enterprise out situation, meaning that we believe that a business's competitive advantage is their data asset that they own, mm. right? And that's typically behind someone's firewall. If you're starting up a new business or if you're running a very large enterprise, your competitive advantage is less about the technology platform. It's much more about the data asset that you are creating. And that's actually your competitive advantage. At IBM, we don't own the data. We've never owned the data before. We have no conflict conflicting interests about what we do with that data. It is the company's data. Is that right? a point of difference? Uh, an enormous point of difference, right? So if you think about it, why is Google, what's Google do? Google does advertising, right? The more data that they accumulate, the better that their, their advertising algorithms get. If you think about Amazon, Amazon wants to acquire as much data as possible because then they can actually do their commerce targeting better. So you can go on, and that's, a, that's a different model. Yeah. IBM's model is all about we want to protect the client's data and give them a competitive advantage. Whether you're a small startup or whether you're an enterprise, you're a government agency or you're a GSI, we're there to help protect that data. By, by having that as a premise, you're basically saying, okay, a hybrid cloud world is the world you're going to be in because there's data assets you want to protect behind the firewall, but you also want to be able to leverage the public data and the advantages of a public cloud. So through Kubernetes, you're able to actually be able to do that. You now start doing that. And philosophically, Red Hat and IBM were very much on the same page around what we meant by container management, how we do container management. So therefore, the marriage of it together comes yeah. together. But it's all about us being, we will be now the number one hybrid cloud company in the world um, based on what I think is very much our core principles. Now, I will say, it took us a few years to get there as a company, yeah. right? We were chasing the public cloud world. But in the reality is we, we got away from what our core is. And our core is about protecting our clients in the enterprise world um, and, pr and protecting a business asset. And I think that's a really important piece. As you as entrepreneurs, think about what you're creating. Think about the data that you're creating. Think about that data asset because that asset 
and the insight that you're providing for the value exchange with your customer who you are, that is the asset you never want to give away. Why would you as a retailer want to give away that data asset to Amazon? I don't know why. I, there's no compelling reason to me why I would want to share that data with someone like an Amazon because they're going to use it to potentially compete against you in the long run. Whereas if you're an enterprise client and you have a lot of retail data, you're going to want to sort of use that to your advantage and, and provide a great value exchange with that customer because you have insight on their behaviors and what they do. And I think some people miss that. Mm. They're looking at the cost equation of it's cheaper to go to a public cloud, so therefore I'm going to go to a public cloud, and they forget that they're losing control of their data asset. Yep. I mean, data is going to be a, quite the big theme going forward, and I think uh, it's, it's an interesting positioning, helps clarify sort of the differentiation point and what your, your vision is for where things are going and why, why IBM is positioning in the way that Correct. IBM is positioning. Well, and I would even bring it down to your business, right? You have data on all the entrepreneurs that are here with yep. you, right? Yep. The last thing you would want to do is to sell that data to a VC. Right. Right? I mean, it's, it's just it all comes back to what is the data asset. Look, I was in the, I was in the ad tech business and the MarTech business for a really long time with AOL, well, maybe five years, but I was there. And, and at that point, it was all about a race of developing the platform. Um, and everybody need, wanted, was buying companies up and the valuations, whether it was Media Math or Rocket Fuel, some of you may remember those companies, it was like IPO, 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 valuations really high. The problem was when everything sort of got to the point of understanding what value you had, if you had a platform, no one actually cared about it. What they really cared about was whether or not you had a data asset that, that augmented that platform. So at AOL, the value of AOL went up not because of the platform I built, but it was because of all the content assets we had, from TechCrunch to the Huffington Post to the AOL sites to the Yahoo sites. All that data insight that was informed by the platform g gave the, the company the valuation, not the platform itself, although it was probably one of the best platforms out there, in my opinion, because um, I built it. <laughs> but well, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't what I really built there. It was about how you're monetizing that data asset. Interesting. So, very, very clear. You know, thanks for that explanation. Now, um, I want to just recenter on the, the the region for a moment because yep. it is kind of uh, it's quite unique actually to have C level executive from IBM coming here uh, to to Dubai, engaging with the the, the startup developer ecosystem, uh, not just once but twice. Yeah. And and then now I know this evening actually your, the team has you on an evening flight over to uh, yeah, to, to Cairo. To, yeah, yeah. Right to to engage with uh, the, uh, the 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 community in, in Egypt as well. So why the uh, why the interest in, yeah. in in the region? Why are you back again? What are you hoping to see out of here? It would be kind of good to to hear. Yeah, so I, I think, again, we go back to what my core mission is. My core mission is to let the 22 million developers in the world and the data scientists in the world understand that IBM is accessible, okay? Because we have not done that. If you look at the $85 billion that IBM generates in revenue annually, it's pretty well lumped up into the top 5,000 big clients in the world, right? We don't necessarily service the long tail clients overall. Um, and quite honestly, the selling motion right now is even if I sell to a CIO in the front door and I get a CIO to say, I'm going to buy IBM and I love IBM Cloud and I love Watson and they sign the contract with it, 95% of the buying decisions are influenced by a developer and a data science now, scientist now. So the side door, right, of I call it the side door strategy of my competitors They'll go in with Amazon Cloud, they'll go in with Microsoft, mm -hmm. they'll start making an awareness of the developer. So at the micro decision level, that developer, data scientist, may decide to go with, even though we've said IBM only, they may decide to go in and use a competitor's platform because they're familiar with it. So my job is to have people understand that, from a development standpoint, that IBM is accessible. Yep. Um, and that there's an option that you can have, and by the way, based on what I just said to you about the data strategy yep. and the hybrid cloud out, there's a big advantage of taking advantage of IBM. We've solved some of the biggest, hairiest problems in the world from, an, from a business standpoint. Why would you risk your business and go to some proprietary cloud platform that you're going to be locked into that you actually have to share your data with? Yeah. That's not a really good business strategy. So I'm out here trying to get and, and keep talking to the communities about things. But at the same time, we've also launched something called Call for Code, which I think we talked about also. Yep. Another one of my big platforms was to launch this year, 
which was to say, look, our technology is so good that we can actually distribute it to and offer it out to um, the 22 million developers in the world to have social impact. So this year, we basically launched something called Call for Code with the United Nations, the American Red Cross, the Linux Foundation, um, and a VC on the West Coast called NIA um, to basically uh, launch a competition. It was a $200,000 prize um, to help solve the, pro the challenges and problems with natural disasters, right? So, and it just wrapped up. Just right? wrapped so up. Can you tell us about the, so what, why, why would IBM do so? This is kind of new, right? Yeah. So why, why, would, why would IBM even spend the, the effort? I'm sure it's a big effort to be able to structure something like this and, and, uh, and, and has it kind of you know, achieve the objectives that you yeah. wanted to in this, in this first so, cycle. So it's a $30 million program over five years. Um, and part of this was, because I can't get everywhere. I can get here at Astro Labs <laughs> and I can get to Egypt, but I can't get around the world, right? So Call for Code, quite honestly, was a, was a program to educate the developers that our tools were accessible and that, by the way, if you came up with a great solution, we're going to support you. Um, to help change the world. Um, and I think that it was pretty successful. It actually, um, if I have to say, overshot my expectations. We had over 100,000 participants worldwide. Um, we hit 156 different countries mm -hmm. um, that participated. We had over 2,500 submissions. There was one winner, it narrowed down to 30. Um, we got down to one winner. There was actually two great ideas that came out of here. Yeah, tell us. Uh, so tell us about like actually the uh, the uh, so ha what kind of ideas like won or got to the finalists. Or yeah. Tell so, us about like the, so the I, most actually, inspiring I'd, ones. I tell you my two favorite okay. uh, th that sort of came out. One was actually out of Germany. Um, so it's kind of amazing when you sort of take your um, your technology and you give it to to a team of people who don't know anything about IBM technology. The ideas that they come back with is something IBM would have never thought about. And when you think about natural disasters, you actually, the first thing people do is say, you know, where, who's the customer, right? Well, the customer, when you think about a natural disaster, is the victims themselves, or they're the first responders. Mm. The people who have to go in and, and are sort of battling the first, the, and there's three categories. There's preparation for a natural disaster, there's the activity while you're in a natural disaster, and then there's the cleanup after. So these ideas were all over the map, but the two that actually really impressed, uh, sort of made me say, oh my, sh my God, we're onto something here. There was one out of Germany where the team actually looked at the global data assets that were out there, and they tapped into the animal migration uh, global database, okay. which was set up so that you could help make sure poaching wasn't happening on some of these animals around the world. And the database has just grown over, over years and over times. What they understood was animals, in particular elephants, um, can help to predict a tsunami before any human being would even know that a tsunami is happening. So they use that global database because when the, anim the elephants start moving from one place to another and they mitigated that with weather data and other data to sort of get the false positives out, yeah. you can actually signal to the affected, potential affected area that there's a potential for a tsunami coming and get people prepared ahead of time. I mean, that's kind of amazing. Like, I, I just, and what they use, they use Watson technology, they use predictive analytics, you know, the basic tools that we would have used in a very large organization they, they put out there to go after. So it's, it's really interesting, in, interesting yeah. stuff. So is that going to repeat itself next year? Is there a new theme? Yeah. And how can people get involved, I guess? In All right, so number one, the call's out there. The, the winner had got $200,000 last week. The winner, uh, Project OWL, uh, was a really, really interesting uh, program, which was about preparedness um, to help uh, first responders get prepared with natural disasters. But also, they tied in hardware. So you actually, what you would do is most of the times after a disaster, your network's down, yep. right? You can't get signals. So what they did was they actually have rubber ducks embedded with IoT devices where a drone would go over the affected area, drop these IoT devices, and basically set up a network. So if you as a victim could actually hook onto that network and tell first responders what your need were, so the first responders could then prioritize, do I have to go into this area or this area or this area, right? So they were the winners. Um, yes, we're going to, in 2019, we're going to launch the program again. The challenge will probably still be in this natural disaster human need standpoint because I don't think we finished the job yet, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. 
We haven't, I think the challenge would much more be about how do we scale the ideas. So how do you use the open source community to really scale the ideas? So if there's an earthquake in Japan, that team actually knows about the applications that are there and can bring them down. So 2019 is yet to be defined. It'll be announced in probably February. Uh, but we, I, I think it's probably in that same zone, maybe healthcare. Interesting. But, it, but it's amazing stuff. If you guys haven't seen it, go to callforcode.org. You can see the ideas out there. The creativeness was pretty profound. And the applications of how you used IBM technology to solve social good problems, number one, hits our core as a brand, which is pretty important. Um, but number two, at the same time, I hopefully I've educated a lot of those developers now to say that IBM was, was uh, accessible. Interesting though, if it doesn't surprise me, uh, India was the number one country uh, for submissions. Hmm. Um, second was the US. Did it come to the US or was Nigeria? Nigeria, Nigeria was the really? second country um, for the number of submissions that came through, which is kind of, kind of unique and it okay. surprised me. Okay, so. very good. Yeah. We've got a couple more questions, but in the interim, make sure you're thinking of yours because we're going to open it up uh, for the second half of the discussion will be an interactive one with uh, everyone here. So uh, please think of your questions for Bob. Um, I, I wanted to pull in on a, um, maybe we pull in on a local example. Yep, okay. Um, and I, because I know, yeah, Willie. I know Willie is here, yep. right? So, uh, Willie, so Tata. Willie, Willie Tata heads up uh, all of our develop advocacy program. So there's some local work that we've done uh, instead of the global work he wants to talk to you guys about yeah, so, and show you. Uh, so look, I, I, I run all of the developer and ecosystems for Bob. Um, and one of the things that, um, just a little bit of my background, I was lucky enough to actually do three startups, so I know where a lot of you guys actually are. Um, we screwed one up, which was part of the process of being an entrepreneur, and then we sold two. The last one was a transaction, about $198 million to a company called Akamai. And then um, I stayed with them to grow that business to about a half a billion dollars. And then Bob called me up and I said, you know, there's some interesting things that we could actually do over there. But one of the takeaways when we and were building, never back. yeah, one of the takeaways that we, what we did when we were looking at businesses, at building a business, was always actually tapping into high growth in particular areas. And I know, um, you know, when you think about this next generation of software-driven enterprises that's disrupting the industry. Those are interesting areas to tap into, and I've seen a couple examples here locally where um, Ghost Lodger, as, Ghost and Lodger, as an example, taking advantage of the Airbnb wave as well as the VRBO home away wave, where this is a high growth area, and what they're looking at is essentially the inverse, which, you know, when you think about Uber, Uber was designed not with the taxis or the black cars in mind, but what the end user was in mind. And of course, Ghost Lodger, Host Lodger is an interesting concept that says, while they have this explosion of available properties, those property managers are now dealing with a bunch of unknown. They're in a business that they don't know. So how do they set up the infrastructure associated to that? But as that business grows, if that's the right play, they're going to grow as well. An another one at the time. That's an Astro alum, actually, so yeah. And, uh, and I believe Leap is as well. So you know, when you take another example is um, a lot of recruiting sites just loaded with data, another data play here, where someone now takes a look at it and say, instead of actually servicing the recruiter, how do you service essentially the person who's applying and give them career advice, give them a community that they can tap actually into? And again, it's a data play against all of the recruiting places that are actually out there. Probably one of those interesting areas that combines hardware, again, along these lines at IoT, is uh, Nikhil, that, um, you know, a very interesting problem is they're going after the red palm weevil um, scenario where oftentimes what you're looking at is uh, a whole um, orchard of trees are dead before you actually know it. So how do they use technology along with software to find that um, infestation at the beginning and attack the trees basically, or the infestation at a small footprint and then basically save the whole, the whole area. I think we had a digital video I see along those lines to actually show that might be um, really informative. Great, well thanks, thanks for that. Thanks, uh, thanks for um, You want to open up questions? Or you want to show the video? Yeah, we're going to play a video. Oh, we're actually playing video. We'll play the video? <laughs> That's why we designed and built a low cost and innovative solution. Let's take a look. Part one, the hardware. We're using a Raspberry Pi with acoustic sensors powered by batteries to record acoustic activity in the palm tree. 
I wasn't standing in the way, so. There it is. We designed and built a low-cost and innovative solution. Let's take a look. Part 1. The Hardware We're using a Raspberry Pi with acoustic sensors powered by batteries to record acoustic activity in the palm tree. Part 2. The Machine Learning Model We trained a supervised machine learning model based on numerous acoustic samples collected from infested and healthy trees. We use logistic regression with various patterns of infestation in the temporal and spectral domain. This model was deployed into IBM Watson Machine Learning so that the IoT devices can regularly be retrained. Let's look at the overall picture. The IoT device connected to the trees records sample at regular intervals using a scheduler. Next, these recordings are analyzed by the machine learning model and are classified as infected or not. Finally, this binary value is updated on ThingWorks, our backend IoT cloud platform. All of this information is visually displayed in a mobile application where the exact location and time of the infection is displayed so that the farmer can take quick action and apply medication to the specific pot. To extend the application, we can easily monitor extra parameters such as sunlight levels, soil quality levels, water levels, and wind speed to improve the quality of the yield. To sum up, we've utilized new technologies to solve for the severe economic impact facing our region. Our solution is easy to install and extremely scalable, as the commercial device will only cost a few dollars. The return? saving the income of thousands of families across the world. Alrighty, well thanks. Good to see a local example, aptly with palm trees. Um, <laughs> no, oh. but, I, but I, look, I think it's a good example of what I was saying before. I mean, this idea that IBM is only for big enterprises, I yeah. think is something that we're trying to dispel as a brand um, and as a company. And I think when you see how accessible the technology is, as an entrepreneur or even as a small business, you can, you can approach the technology in a very different way. Fantastic. All righty. Great. So um, I, I'll, my, my last question to wrap up with is just for some advice, I would yeah. say. Just, uh, you know, you've got like the startup developer ecosystem um, within this new context. If we're going back to the discussion you talked about in terms of your engagement with uh, Red Hat, your, think, your thought about uh, the way, the way the, where's the ball going, um, what's your advice for, for entrepreneurs in, uh, in Dubai and in, the, in kind of like this uh, MENA ecosystem, if you will? Um, well, look, I think, I think number one, like I said in the beginning, I do think you're in a place where you really have a unique advantage um, the way that Astrolabs is set up. Uh, number one, just take advantage of that, not just come in here and sort of work on your own company, but network with all your peers around you because you're probably all facing similar, similar challenges. Um, I would tap into sort of the infrastructure that Mo Mohammed and the team have set up um, because that stuff you, you can't really get anywhere else. Even if you were funded from somebody, um, the benefit of getting the network uh, is really, really important. And don't, uh, don't sort of minimize that piece. That's a really, really important piece you want to take advantage of. Um, number two, I, I would, you know, if I had to, if I had to roll back my life, um, I would make sure that the fundamental principles that you're building in your business are sound and can actually uh, hit an economic model that works. Um, and I would go back to our comments before, are you collecting some kind of unique proprietary data asset uh, that allows your company to monetize differently than someone else? Um, and I think that's a really, really important, a really, really important premise. Whether that's you're creating something like an Airbnb and you understand the behaviors of how people, it's less about them renting hotel or shared rooms. It's much more about the data that they're collecting on people's behaviors and how they move from city to city and what their needs are. That asset will be monetized over time, right? It's less about the transaction that's happening and the technology that's happening. It's much more about that. Even when you look at Uber right now, Uber's getting actually their biggest growth area is from Uber Eats. It's not necessarily from the, the, the model that they started the business on. It's the data asset that they're getting around the behaviors of the individual. And that's really, really important. And for all the stuff that's out there around data protection and data privacy, I think that's important. But when you sign into something, you're giving 
you know, the, you, I'm giving Uber permission to use all of their behavioral stuff on me, not specifically for Bob Lord, but in general to understand what consumer behavior is about, which will inform their next model to move forward. Why did Microsoft buy LinkedIn? Mm. Why did Microsoft get, get GitHub? They bought it not because they're going to change those platforms. They bought it because now they have a data asset where they can understand business needs better so they can develop their products. And now they understand the developer's mindset better in GitHub so that they can actually move their products. It's about the data asset yep. that really gives you the value. And I think it's when entrepreneurs start, sometimes you think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the fastest platform out there you know, to compete or I'm going to have the best transaction engine. That's sort of the commodity. I hate to say it. I hope no one's building that right now. But <laughs> that's the commodity. You have to make sure you're getting a data asset on it. Um, so that, that, I think that's that good. would be my, my, if I had to wind it back. Because I, I, I do think in my career, specifically on, with AOL, when I built the platform, I thought it was the fastest platform, the nanosecond that was going to win. But at the end of the day, the valuation of the company was because of the, the data we were creating. That's really interesting. Thanks for that, and thank you for for uh, for your your thoughts. I want to do I open it up to the uh, to the group here for any questions that you might have uh, for Bob. We've got some time for your engagement. So, what's on your mind? Yes. Hi. Hi, Kareem. Uh, Kareem. My name is. Uh, so we have, we're working at a company called uh, Portenders. We're a big data play on construction, basically. Uh, one of the big problems that we're having as a company is a lot of our data for. Uh, com uh, customers, which are big developers, is very private, right? Yeah. And so one of the requirements we have is that all of their servers have to be located within the country at least. So I think IBM doesn't really have uh, data centers here in the Middle East, or yeah. do they? Or is that part of the plan, something we can No, that's part, with? so I do think there are some private data centers, yeah. uh, and uh, Massimo to Cream can answer those questions for you, yeah. but there are specific ways that we're working around that with clients, yeah. based on having the local data stored here, yes. Do you want to jump in? Later. You'll know that answer better than I will. Yeah, OK. Yes? Coming back to the digital assets aspect, so Facebook and Google have the biggest data assets in the world, probably. Yeah. And we can see where the whole privacy issues is growing and so forth. How do you project that's going to change or evolve over the next two, three years in terms of regulation, in terms of monopoly, in terms of the ability to monetize it, and so forth? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd suggest to you um, that some brands haven't been very responsible with the data assets that they were given. Um, I'm not sure that they actually valued the data asset to the point that they needed to um, and ensure that it was protected the way that it needed to be protected. Um, I do think strategically as a brand, whoever you may be, you have an obligation to protect your customer. What I'm talking about when I talk about data asset, I'm not talking about the, p the personal information that you know about me. It's much more about the trended information that you can get and finding out what is the signal and all the noise of a conglomerate of your customer base, not specifically that one customer. Because if you can find signals in the noise, you can find a pattern through that data signal, that will help you actually drive your business in the right direction. Um, I, I, I think we're in a really interesting spot right now, but honestly, uh, if we take a data set and you use machine learning and you use AI to figure out what those, uh, those regression models are and what the pattern is, your business is going to perform better because you're going to have insight that you normally wouldn't have. Um, and look, I think Starbucks does a phenomenal job at that, right? Um, because the value exchange I get from Starbucks Want, I will give Starbucks more of my information uh, because the value exchange that I get as a consumer from them is very good. And I think there's a lot of companies that are doing it well. Delta Airlines is another. Airline industry probably does it really well, too. The value exchange I give, I'll give them a lot of my information because they're protected. So I do think, um, I think we're in a, an interesting spot. And I do think potentially some regulation would be very good. Um, but as a, as a tech company, you have a responsibility to protect data and the customer data or else you could be in a situation that you're some of the people you mentioned that are in right now. And that's, uh, it, it, you can't forget that there's a person on the other end of that data and you have to protect that data, that person's interest. The good news is the next, what, next generation coming in, they'll share more data. They mm. want to share more data, right? They're in, predisposed to share more data. Yeah. 
So, so that's why I said a data asset is your competitive advantage. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. go for it. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm not a developer, and I'm probably in one of the least sexy digital spaces, um, education. Yeah. And I feel it's most likely because at the end of the day, you still need a, a human in front of you. Yeah. So in the age of digital disruption, what advice would you give to maintain and value human connections? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's so interesting to me. So number one, I, education in the whole education sector is going to be just transformed dramatically by data and AI. And the example I'll give you is Peloton. Okay. I think Peloton's done a really, really nice job um, taking um, the human connection in the data asset and the instruction that they give in a real life sort of situation, as well as all the data that they collect. Because they collect a ton of data so that the value exchange that you and I have together when I'm on the Peloton bike. So Peloton, b b by sorry. the way, yes, it's a, it's, it's a, a US based uh, <laughs> company that does um, uh, interactive uh, uh, lessons, cycling. Signing class, cycling classes, right? Where there's a, for those who don't know, there's a video that's happening at the same time that you're interacting with, but you're in the comfort of your own home. So it's basically a live stream cycling class. And basically what you're on is you're on this monitor there but what's, what's really interesting about it is once you start to get on a cycle and you get on a program, you now start to compete against other people. They serve you up the courses and the, and the people that you like the most, right? So when you think about the education sector, the more customized I can get to give Bob Lord his curriculum versus the general curriculum. Like if I had to go do my education all over again, I probably wouldn't have taken half the courses that I took just because I had hit the core curriculum. If the education system came back to me and said, Bob, you're interested in these, this is your, your personalized core curriculum, and these are the reasons why it should be your core curriculum, that's an opportunity. That's an enormous opportunity. Again, it's less about the interface of how I deliver the curriculum. It's much more about the data asset that you give to the person who wants to be educated. If I could, if I could give my whole team right now, hey, if you want to be the next version of the best data scientist in the world, this is the core curriculum you need to, you need to put in place. That's an in, incredible value add. I mean, Khan Academy did a really nice job getting things online. But again, it didn't give me personalized information about what I should be doing going forward. And I think that's the opportunity there. Hey, Bob. Interesting. Yeah, oh, yeah. And actually, we're, I forgot about that, Lavelli. Uh So we actually uh, launched a $27 million program um, in Africa called DNA uh, Africa, which is they've incorporated our uh, technology programs into the grade school so that they take programs online, they get certification, um, and then by 11th and 12th grade, they have to, in order for them to graduate, they have to understand cloud, AI, the basics of it. But it's part of their curriculum so that they're more inclined to go into science and technology as a career path going forward. And South Africa uh, actually now required it and put it into the program. So Massimo is running the program, and we're actually talking about how we actually take what we've done in Africa and bring it into the UAE. So I think that's on track for. Wow, January available in UAE and Saudi. I mean, what's great about what's great about the education sector is if you can get the digital experience right, and you can get the curriculums lined up yep. so that they're per more personalized, you have a it's a it's a great success for it all. But again, it's back to the data. It's how are you creating a curriculum that's mining the data to give somebody an experience that they normally have. And I'm sorry, I apologize for the Peloton example. I forgot where I was. No, but it's fine. I think it's a lot of people popular. do know. But yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yes, other questions? Yes, please. Hello, my name is Ashraf Kanjo. I work for DigitSoul. One of the key things when we go and sell cloud services to our clients is we talk about the collaboration tools uh, in terms of how can they transform them digitally. So when we speak about Google, they have the, all the collaborative tools. When we speak about Microsoft, it's the same uh, up which applies. So I wonder, does uh, IBM support the data with collaboration tools for Teams? And Yeah. So, um, so when I talk about hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud means there's a multi-cloud world that we're in. Um, so there are advantages to going with some of the other cloud providers. 
most of our clients now have selected five plus cloud providers. Um, so the collaboration tools that we have is much more around cloud orchestration because it gets so complex now. Because you have very large companies that have different cloud providers and none of them connect together. So a lot of the collaboration tools is our multi-cloud orchestration tools that allow you to use Kubernetes and others to sort of work in those different. Because Google Cloud may have some collaboration tools that you want to use in a certain department for somebody that, to get advantage of, let's say, Google Analytics, right? That they have a great lead in for, for the marketing department. So you may want to be on that cloud for that reason. But you want to be able to orchestrate that cloud benefit with either the IBM Cloud or the Microsoft Cloud or the Amazon Cloud. Amazon Cloud you may want to use for storage because it's the cheapest one that you can get for data storage. So we're in this we're in this world. Or when we talk about hybrid cloud, I'm talking about being open. I'm talking about having multi-cloud orchestration. So you're gonna because you want to take advantage of those those uh, the connection points by each cloud. Sure there. Other questions? And not give away your data. In the back. Yeah, I, I think I can speak up. But uh, uh, because we're recording, you should take uh, a mic. We're recording, so you have to. Okay. But and nice projection. Us, yeah, you, I heard you, uh, yeah, but no one else online great. heard you. <laughs> um, so my question was, when, when you're talking about um, this kind of data-driven hyper-personalization where um, you know, everyone's being recommended not just, you know, what to watch next, but also what classes to take throughout their career path or their education. Are we also inadvertently putting uh, blinders on people and, and creating these echo chambers that we already see in social media, but now extrapolating that out to all aspects of life, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, online dating platforms and, um, Curri digital curricula that are that are going to be data driven. Uh, what responsibility do we have, and do giants like IBM have in terms of the stewardship of this this data, and, and not just thinking about optimizing for engagement, but also optimizing for having, you know, a next generation of people that don't have blinders on and have more peripheral vision, have more exposure to things that are maybe. Uh, tangential to what they would originally be intended, yeah. uh, interested in. No, I, so look, that's a really huge <laughs> question, uh, which we could spend like <laughs> two days on. And honestly, at IBM, we've actually built a tool called OpenAI. Um, because so what you're asking is, do the machine learning algorithms have biases built into them that would prevent people from actually exploring uh, sort of the next place they want to go? Whatever you talk about, right? Um, so there are two elements to biases when you get to sort of artificial intelligence. One is the model itself. Was the model built by a bunch of white guys? Um, and there was a bias in how they actually built that model based on there. And then the second is, does the data, data have bias because it was built by another class of people or the data coming in is biased? So therefore, the insurance company is always lending to you know, white females because that they, they supposedly have a better record and it just sort of fulfills itself. So the OpenAI's tool set that we have, number one, opens up the, the black box to the business owner so that they understand how the regression model works within the box so that if there's a new variable that comes in, that variable is highlighted and it said this new variable is actually helping to make that decision. Because we know that the biggest challenge of adoption of machine learning and AI tools across our across our customer set is understanding what those decision-making principles are. So as IBM, we have opened up, our, our responsibility is to be very clear about how the decisions are being made. Because as of human beings, we don't understand how those decisions are being made and how the models are progressing. Because the models learn over time, right? And they start making different decisions. You need to know as the human being how those decisions are being made. Because if we let that go, well, then we're sort of in a different world that we shouldn't be in. Then the second piece is, how do we eliminate the biases that come from the training data? Um, and now we've, in OpenAI, have created an, a world where if the machine picks up the fact that the biases, like the types of data that's coming in, there's red flags that shoot up to say, this model could be biased based on the data, so you go back to the data source to start looking at that. So, so I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I, I'm talking more about uh, if we look at, for example, the, the political sphere in the US where you have higher polarization than we've ever had before, it, is creating these recommendation <laughs> engines that are AI- You want me to talk politics No, 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 not, no politics. not politics. Not, not politics at all, but, <laughs> yeah. but in terms of like, 
if we're <laughs> Go if for we're it. recommending what people based on data models that are sound, not polluted, have have data that's 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 not biased, it is actually what they care about or what they would be most interested in. Are they limiting? Are we limiting people's capacity to be able to relate to other people? If it's recommending oh. that you take computer science courses throughout your life, and that does fit better with what your competencies are, but then you're never going to take a philosophy elective and be able to relate to people that think differently than you think right brain versus left brain. Are we creating a world well, that's increasingly right, siloed? So, but you're already you're a bi biasing that question to me, <laughs> right? You're assuming that computer science people, which is partly me, aren't sort uh, of having. Myself as no, well. No, I know. So, but I mean, you're, you're sort of saying that because you're studying computer science basically says that you can't relate to other people. So I, I, I actually think if you're, if you're asking the question, of understanding the sciences in general, and you're narrowing down to computer science. I just think that's a um, it, it, the the model the the best. There's a new study out that says IQ and EQ. We used to talk a lot about that, right? Um, IQ was sort of like the thing people used to, companies used to major on. Then they said, oh my God, no, I have to understand emotional quotient of somebody because that's actually a really good predictor of how somebody is going to perform in my company. There's now a third one, which is called LQ, which has just come out, which is about learning quotient. Hmm. Can you actually be somebody that learns the next evolution to actually become a better employee? So that could be that you have to learn computer science capabilities. That could be that you have to learn how to relate to people better. That could be that you have to learn managerial skills. Actually, the better employee or the better performer, the better predictive who's going to be a good entrepreneur is not IQ or EQ. The studies are coming back saying whether or not you are the better learner of whatever is happening in the world at that moment. So I would suggest to you that if the machine learning algorithm, go back to education, is actually being a learning organism, um, that it should actually recommend to you, you know what, you're, you're getting biased and you should go over there. You're too skewed. There, yeah, you're too skewed. So that, that I don't know. We can have Other a debate questions. about that. Yes. Yeah, right, right up here in the front. Wait for the mic. Hi, Bob. Hi. I'm Sonia. Um, I noticed that you worked uh, with a digital marketing agency called Razorfish prior to this. Yes. Right. Um, my question is, um, given the fact that any digital marketing agency is the perfect bridge between a client and um, how, how does uh, data access or data information or that pattern feature into this entire equation? How can agencies help their clients better? Yeah. So what it's an interesting question. So in my life, sort of just the whole agency world has been turned upside down. Um, and I do think the agency world is turned upside down because I do think that data insight is now an important component to any marketer. And if you are a CMO and you're not thinking about data first, you're not going to be a successful marketer. Because I do think that although um, you may not make that final branding decision based on the data. The data should educate you so that you become a better marketer. Um, and um, I think the agency world has, ch has been challenged to bring data into the equation. Now, I was in that world for a while. So there were people who ran TV spots, right? And it was all about the madman world or the mad woman world, which was I will tell you to smoke cigarettes and you will not talk back to me. Okay? Two things happened in the world. Number one, the consumer got a voice and said cigarettes are bad for me. And oh, by the way, technology became much more accessible through cloud computing and AI. So therefore, the world of what marketing meant and what it was doing was not about advertising. It was about creating a two-way conversation. You start to create a two-way conversation. I now have to have a value exchange with somebody. And that value exchange is based on the data mm. that I have about the person and what I'm going to talk to that person about. Or, by the way, even better, what is that subscription model I'm going to put in place where actually my product becomes better because now I'm getting an ongoing feedback loop about my product. Right? I don't like this. I don't like that. You need to change it. Your cereal tastes awful. Why does it taste awful? Because of this ingredient you put in. I don't like Coke 1 before Coke 1 actually goes out. I mean, it, now I'm a different marketer because my marketing is not about creating Coke is the best. My marketing is all about, oh my god, that taste I just sent out there has to be refined so I know my customer set's going to like it. So you now become this almost, um, you're almost, it's tied to sales and marketing is almost the same idea. 
And I think some of the great stuff when you think about these new subscription models that are in place, whether you think about an Uber or you think about an Airbnb, they're constantly getting feedback from their customers on an ongoing basis, but it's based on data, right? It's based on whether or not somebody liked the ride. You know, did you like that experience you just had? And that data asset, so when you think about now an agency world and you think about the old digital agencies, the digital agencies are really just that bridge to educate customers about you need to put data into your marketing programs. But now it's gotten to the point where these platforms are so ubiquitous yep. and my consumer has such a voice about what they want that I now, the marketing role, really becomes this dynamic product development role in marketing um, that has to be tightly linked. So as a startup, you have such a great opportunity because you have no department silos, right? You don't have any department silos where the marketing department's getting insight from the customers and now you get over and convince product marketing to make a change. You're, con you're changing that product, right, on scale. So where does the agency world fit in? The old Marlboro man doesn't really fit in anymore. anymore. And that's the model that's being challenged going forward. Fantastic. Right. Well, I think uh, we've heard themes around <laughs> data, obviously, and the, 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 the trend and the change in the entire industry and, and IBM's role in that. I mean, I know uh, it has been a pleasure from Astrolab's perspective. I, I appreciate the warm words at the beginning. Similarly, working with IBM and, and hosting members of the IBM team who have been here at Astrolabs, engaging with the startups, running different meetups so you can keep, a, keep tabs on the meetups that we have uh, going on that will uh, actually be practical uh, introductions and deep dives into elements of the IBM cloud and different ways to be able to make some of what uh, Bob has been talking about happen. Uh, as well as all the support um, locally from the team, we, we, we do appreciate and look forward to kind of taking it to the next level um, in, uh, in the next year. And I want to just thank you again for making the, the stop here in, in Dubai and for, for engaging with all of us uh, during this discussion. So Great. I want to invite everybody actually to join us for some lunch and, uh, and, yeah, and some mingling afterwards. So, yeah, yeah. So you hey, and good luck to all of you. Uh, look forward to hearing some of the ideas you come out with and the companies you're starting. So good luck to you all. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks.